crap. You are listening to Amazing Outdoors, episode 34. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. On today's show, we have Neil Hogger. He's got a YouTube channel out there called the American Land Man. I met Neil when I went to go look at one of his listings in Northeast, I'm sorry, Northwestern Wisconsin, when I was out looking for land. Neil is a Whitetails Unlimited, no, I'm sorry, Whitetail Properties real estate agent. Fantastic guy, knows his stuff. If you're looking to purchase land in northeast or northwestern Wisconsin, I grew up in northeastern Wisconsin. Northwest Wisconsin, if you're looking to buy land, get in touch with Neil. His information will be in the show notes. We kind of discuss a bunch of different topics in today's show. Neil is considering, and I'm considering having Neil back as a semi-regular guest here to kind of break down the topic of land management in smaller segments that I think owners of land or people who are trying to acquire land and are overwhelmed with the possibilities of what to do with this piece of property, either once they've bought it or once they've kind of honed in on a piece of property that they want to buy or maybe a scenario. So we're going to break this down. We'd really like to hear from you and if you want to shoot me an email, Brian at Amazing Outdoors. If there's anything specific that you would like to hear uh, related to what's best practices for managing your property, we'd love to have your questions, build a show based on listener feedback. Please email me if you have some particular questions. Neil and I will talk about them on the show and uh, hopefully answer some of your questions specifically, as well as educate some of the other listeners. Before I dive into show, the show today, going to take a little bit of a different route with uh, the title sponsor here, Upland Outfitters. I got to mention the Relentless Pants. I have now officially had them on and working in the field for the better part of the whole entire season, minus a day or two. <laughs> I got to put them in the wash once in a while. <laughs> I have been wearing them out in the pheasant field in the woodcock cover. I've been trying to kill a few grouse, but really haven't had as much time as I normally would. I have had them on the raft and the drift boat, musky fishing. They are fantastic pants. You will find that you will not just want to wear these pants out in the field or in the woods. You're going to want to wear them a lot. So I doubled down. Jason gave me a pair to test out so I can actually talk about them from a Uh, standpoint of confidence and I loved them so much I bought another pair Jason's still offering for the relentless pants and and whatever you buy with Upland Outfitters U-P-L-N-D Upland Outfitters 20% off promo code amazing so take advantage of that he's got some pants in Um, I'm gonna do a giveaway here coming up we're gonna launch that On the next show, I actually interview Jason, and we talk a little bit about what he's got going on, some things in the works, supply chain struggles with launching new products and such, but uh, catch up with him after his fire season, and uh, he got injured on a fire, so he hasn't really been a chance to get out and bird hunt much, so he had a whole bunch of time to talk to me, and uh, I caught up with him yesterday, so we'll be releasing that show next week. Keep an eye out for a giveaway. And also remember, if you're going to buy these pants, if you're interested in them, 20% off, it's still available out there for all of the listeners. 
your friends, whoever you want to use it, save some money, get these pants. You will not regret it. Upland Outfitters, U-P-L-N-D. No A in the Upland Outfitters. We stole it, remember? So moving on, I do want to mention Chippewa River Custom Rods. Tom has been an awesome partner with me at the guide business and really taking care of me with rods and I love them to death. The one piece is a crazy nut, awesome musky fly rod. His two pieces are good. The musky saber, uh, four piece, fantastic rod. And you're buying them. You're supporting a small business. And I think that's really important as well. And that's why I really wanted to mention uh, Tom, if you tell them, uh, I think it might be uh, promo code AMAZING10, you think you get 10% off. Uh, if you let him know you heard about him on the podcast, he'll help you out with a discount, I'm sure. Chippewa River Custom Rods. Check them out on the internet. Finally, I will mention River Rats USA. I had Brian Walker up for the Musky Fly Invitational out of Hayward. We floated in the rat for two days, three guys, unbelievable time. Just uh, the muskies were a little bit, well, non-cooperative. What can you do? It's fishing. The long and short of that is we absolutely had a blast in that little boat. It can hold three full-size guys. It is a great little vessel. If you're in the upper Midwest here and you're considering buying one, you want to take a look at one, give me a holler, shoot me an email, brian at amazing outdoors. I'm sorry, brian at amazing.com. Uh, you can find uh, more information, contact me at www.amazen.com. Get a hold of me if you have any questions about the river rat. I'd be happy to show you my boat how I rig it. It's a fantastic vessel. And uh, feel free to get, in, get a hold of me if you have it. Again, any questions, want to chat with somebody who's an owner of one of these boats, feel free to get Brian uh, Walker or anybody out at River Rats. They have great customer service. They've been fantastic to me. But if you want to talk to somebody who's uh, unaffiliated, not getting paid, I'm just running this boat in my guide service and out doing my fishing. So uh, I did get a little bit of a deal on it, but uh, that doesn't warrant me to to really advertise for them like I am. So I'm mentioning this is because they're good folks. It's a good product. I really enjoy it. And if you're looking for a smaller vessel to get on some of these rivers and get away from some people with motorboats, hey, consider the River Rat, River Rat USA. Neil Hogger today we kind of go down a bunch of different rabbit holes. So I can't even really give a real bit of a theme to this uh, episode other than we talk about some of the hunting that we've been doing here in the Midwest, a little bit of the whitetail rut, uh, get to know Neil a little bit. I think Neil's going to come back again. You want to know more about land management. Maybe you want to know more about purchasing a piece of land. Email me, brian at amazing.com. We'll roll some of this up into a show, hopefully, and have Neil back in a couple weeks, month, two months. Really depends on his schedule and how we can collide. I appreciate you holding on as uh, we kind of launch season two, and I'm in the middle of winding down my musky fly, uh, musky fishing season, trying to get my dogs out and do uh, more bird hunting, and spending a little bit of time in the tree trying to trying to put a buck on the meat pole for the season, and getting a little trigger happy, so. That's going to probably go to the wayside here quick because I think Bob White quail season in Kansas is upon us. So I will be down there shortly, hopefully chasing coveys of Bob White. So anyways, let's get on to today's show. Enjoy my conversation with Neil. Keep an eye out next week on Instagram and uh, for the podcast with Jason of Upland Outfitters. We will be giving away a pair of these pants and I'll be releasing some details on how you can win them. Welcome to the Amazing Outdoors podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Brian. You know, we kind of got hooked up. I was looking for some land, and uh, you've done an amazing job kind of carving out a brand for yourself and kind of utilizing some of your expertise. 
in a different way than most people are out in the, the market. Um, you know, you're a whitetail property uh, real estate agent, but you really kind of uh, brand yourself as a, as a land management specialist or a land specialist. And uh, when I was out looking for land, Neil, that really resonated with me, um, given the fact, you know, I'm a huge outdoorsman. I'm looking at, per, you know, I looked at purchasing some land and I wanted somebody who I felt was on, kind of on par with me for my understanding of what both hunting and, and property development could, could potentially be long term. So can you give everybody a little bit of an introduction? I, you know, we've stayed in touch. I ran across you in the Bear Woods while I was out grouse hunting this, this <laughs> fall and we kind of got reconnected. And um, to make a, a long winded introduction here, um, I really liked, uh, again, kind of the way you've branded yourself, what you bring into the table for, for buyers out there or just educating people about land. So can you, yeah. give, can you give the listeners an introduction to yourself, kind of wh- what you're doing today and kind of how you got there? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's kind of odd that we just, on all the back roads of all the places that we could have both been on that day, we literally crossed paths walking. I was bear hunting and you were grouse hunting and what were the odds of, of that <laughs> happening? But, uh, but yeah, so well, I work for uh, Whitetail Properties Real Estate. I'm a land specialist real estate agent. That's what I do for a living. And um, as you kind of alluded to, I've got a blog called The American Land Man, um, and and I talk about buying, managing, and selling land. And it's been, that brand is, you know, I'll kind of dive into that a little bit later. Well, Neil, real quickly, too, you do more than just, you know, educating people on buying land. You do everything from, you know, land management, too, uh, you know, setting up your food plots or things like that, giving, giving advice on how to really groom that piece of property that you've purchased as well. Yeah. Well, the American landman is a concept. It's a, it's not me. And I have people, I think people confuse what I'm actually trying to get done with that name, but it, I don't know, you, you know, people turn it into different things, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm Neil Hogger, number one, and I'm a land specialist for Whitetail Properties Real Estate foremost, and maybe number two. And the American landman to me is more of a concept. It's a, this philosophical person that loves American land. And it could be a guy that has bought land that owns land. Maybe they've been on a family farm for centuries, or it could be a guy that just, I just want to be a a land man. I want to own land. And, and that kind of has resonated with people. I've got calls from all over the world from people that say, Hey, I want to own American land someday. It's my dream. And so they're kind of drawn to that concept. So it's kind of, you know, now that I'm getting a chance to talk about it, just to make it clear to people, I am not the American landman, the only American landman. I, to me, it's a community. It's a it's a concept. Um, and so that's kind of what that was about. But yeah, the blog, if people want to check it out, youtube.com forward slash Neil Hogger Land Specialist. Shameless plug there. Um, but we talk about buying land and then managing land and then selling land. And I think my niche is, really leaning towards the acquisition and selling of land with, you know, what happens in the middle. And I always try to talk to people and educate people on the opportunity of land brings the wealth building, how to improve it, how to force equity and how to enjoy it. Because some of my short videos are just me hunting and me you know, showing people what I've done on my property with the animals that I'm seeing. And, and it's almost like I told my editor, it's almost like voyeurism. I, you know, I'm showing people a window into my, you know, slice of American land, my 121 acres. That the only way you see it is if I invite you or you trespass. But I put it out on video and I freely show everything I'm doing. So that's been the concept. Well, and sharing that knowledge too is kind of some of the concept of why I started the podcast here. Um, knowledge is such a enlightening and freeing thing. You know, if, if you have retained the knowledge to be able to go out and do something on your own is very empowering. And I think that you give people a lot of that knowledge and and the little tidbits maybe that they didn't think about or, you know, inspiring them to to actually go out and purchase some land. And you touched on something in your, your um, kind of introduction here that it really kind of struck a chord with me. And that's the wealth building part of it. Um, You know, for me, I, I, I grew up in a family that we had land always had land and my grandfather 
was the type of person that really didn't trust the stock market. You know, he went through World War II and uh, watched uh, in, in Holland, watched the Nazis come in and confiscate everything. And so when he came to America, you know, he, he decided that, you know, he was, he was going to buy land because in America we could, we could do that and in substantial tracts of land. And so he taught, he dumped all of his money into land. And then I was gracious enough to, to, to be given a little bit of inheritance a uh, number yeah. of years ago. And I went through two downturns in the market with that money and lost so much sleep because I don't know the stock market. I don't, I don't understand it but I understand land. And um, so I knew for me personally that getting my money out of the market that was you know, not qualified for some type of retirement account and getting it into land and not only land, but recreational property that my family could enjoy, you know, the, the benefit of owning land and somewhat some of the drawbacks sometimes, you know, you, you don't have to go mow the grass on that 401k plan. However, you also don't get to mow the grass on that 401k plan. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. The land, you know, the land is something you could walk on, you can touch, you can feel, work on it, do anything you want on it. And I, you know, people ask me a lot, is land a good investment? And I'll say, well, you know what? I think it should be part of a complete portfolio. And maybe it's not your first purchase, or maybe it is, but. I don't just own land. I own stocks and, and I'm in the stock market pretty heavy. And I also own residential rec- uh, real estate that I have rentals. Um, I also own uh, vacation rentals and I do VRBO and Airbnb. And my recreational hunting land is just really a slice of my diverse portfolio. And that's, that's how I look at it. But I, you know, I think I'm like, a, of people out there I, I grew up blue collar you know my whole family was uh factory workers and we would every november starting about right now i mean it consumed us and we would think about it and then we'd all pile in these vans and old chevys and drive up to the uh, melon excuse me maryland wisconsin clark county wisconsin area and we would hunt public land and we would We'd go out there like this orange army in a big line, tramps into the woods. We'd spread out, and, and whatever walked by that was legal, that's what we shot. And man, we were happy to do it. And at night, we'd celebrate in a local pub, and then and, and we, you know, stayed with a farmer family. We rented uh, rooms, and that was our annual thing. And we, the idea of owning land was never, it never even came up. I mean, it seemed, I think back then, it seemed like such a far-fetched idea that we would own land. And even owning land to manage like I do now wasn't even a thing then. It just, it just people didn't do it. But as I started growing up, I don't know, something triggered me, I think. Well, I know what it did. I mean, I started watching Whitetail Properties Television, the company I work for, and they have a show about it. And they talked about buying land and owning it, the joys of it, and just everything that goes with land ownership, it just started piquing my interest. So probably around, I'm going to say around, I got out of graduate school in 1997. I started thinking about land and I was looking for pieces of land. And at the time, you know, Buffalo County was kind of like not too far from there. I went to UW, University of Wisconsin, lacrosse. And Buffalo was like the place. Everybody knows Buffalo County. And I was looking at that. It was probably... I'm going to think back then it was probably a thousand bucks an acre ish, maybe a little bit more. And that just seemed so expensive to me. I mean, it just, Oh my gosh, so far to reach a thousand dollars an acre. And I didn't really have any plan to make it happen. I, I didn't know how to do it. How do I find it? How do I make an offer? How do I get a loan? I mean, everything that goes into it and all the questions I hear now, still, there's so many people that just don't understand how to do it. And so For me, my first purchase actually was in Ashland, Wisconsin area, uh, in the little town of Mellon in Ashland County, way up north. And the only reason I even bought that is I was thinking about buying land. I had some money by that point. I was working, and I'd put some money away. And I ended up taking an equity line of credit out of my house. I ran into this guy who was a doctor when I was doing my sales route. And one thing led to another. We started talking about land, and I had mentioned to him I wanted to own land someday up north. I always had that dream, and and six months later, I get a call from some random guy, and he was another doctor. He said, "Hey, I heard you're looking to buy some land," and I said, "Well, I guess. I mean, I'm I'm always thinking about it." 
Long story short, my uh, girlfriend, now my wife, and I drove up there. We walked around, and I bought the first piece of property I ever walked on. And I didn't know what I was doing. The guy helped me write my offer. <laughs> I probably made every mistake possible. It turned out okay. And I ended up turning that property over. I tripled my money. So I bought that for 119000 and about 2005, I sold it. For three hundred seventy-eight thousand in two thousand and nineteen, I think two thousand and twenty, and then I bought my new uh, property that I'm at now, and I bought that at three hundred seventy-five thousand, and I think I could get a market uh, sale price of around six hundred right now uh, because of what I've done to it and the market improving, and that's kind of and along the way I learned how to do it because I came a land specialist, I got licensed, and now. Now I do it. Uh, I buy property. I flip property. I'm I'm working on a flip right now. I think I'm going to make about fifty thousand bucks on that flip. And that's what the guys at Whitetail Properties taught me that you can buy land, improve it, and sell it and move up. And that's how you increase your net worth. Exactly, and that's kind of what what, what I'm planning on doing over at my place. Um, you know, we're gonna we're on kind of I'm I'm hoping I. Ten year track because I would like to build out there and yeah. get my residency out there and then have all of that improvement on the whole property in its sense. Go from bare land, thirty two acres to a nice pole barn, nice home, and um, you know really retain that kind of growth over the course of this ten years. Um, it's it's really something that I'm kind of excited to see. Uh, I sit on okay. I sit on the porch of my my uh, pole barn and I. I joke with my wife you know it's it's one thing I, i'd love to go out to the deer stand but it's even more fun to sit on the porch and oh, have a beer and watch the the dollar signs I, grow <laughs> i totally i tell you what that is not an understatement and there are so many people that have that exact same dream and it's kind of a niche a very small niche in the real estate market and most agents don't understand it most buyers don't understand it they hear about it i mean they watch guys on television shows and they even watch my blog and they they see us kind of doing they see us talking about it but the actual steps to make it happen is such a mystery to so many people and i talk to people about this all the time and that's why i started filming it i said i'm just gonna put this out there because so many people are asking me like about this they're interested in it but nobody's talking about it i think i'm the only show on on youtube that actually puts this out there i've actually had people call me after they're watching my vlog and this may be a downside i see it as an upside though i'm on your farm on the edge i'm driving the roads around your property i'm on the southern side this guy called me and he says there's a 160 inch buck in the field and at first i got a little creeped out that somebody actually found my place because of me talking about it but then on the other hand i went well that's cool he found my place because i was talking about it which is the reason i did it and i've had people in the industry say you really do you really want to tell people how to do this and i'm like yeah i do actually because i think the more that you give the more you get 99 percent of people are probably never going to capitalize on what i did but that one percent that i can help unveil the, the secrecy which is not a secret but if i could just help somebody do it i, I don't know to me it's, it's so rewarding if you look at my uh facebook page i've been posting pictures of guys with bucks and they're all coming off of properties that i helped them get first time buyers and they're shooting 150 160 you know inch class year year after year so not only did i help them buy it i helped them re realize these dreams and then some of these guys, I'm even advising them on how to improve their land a little bit and how to, you know, make it better. And along the way, they're, they're, they're hunting with their family. They're having great hunts. They're killing nice trophies. And they're increasing. They're forcing equity on that investment. And they will make a lot of money on it. So it's awesome. I, I, I agree with the concept wholeheartedly. And it's, again... I hate to kind of shamelessly plug my own podcast here, but it's it's why I started the podcast. Again, it's back to that knowledge piece and sharing that wealth of knowledge with other people. And like you said, you know, ninety nine percent of the people aren't going to capitalize on it. But if you can get one person that takes action out of what kind of information that you've provided out there, it's really a net positive on the whole community. Really, truly is. 
And you can take that concept from buying land all the way to hunting like yeah, I've done here. You know, I'm trying to inspire people to get out of their comfort zone and go try something new and grab the neighbor kid or, you know, get somebody else in, out, outdoors and get them into hunting and fishing. And it's, it's all about is sharing that knowledge and kind of lighting that fire in somebody to go take action. And you're doing the same thing with purchasing of land and helping other people build wealth and kind of that generational wealth, which is super, yeah. super important. Well, you know, a lot, I've had feedback this way too. It's not all about money. I never plan on selling. And, I, and I'm like, I'm not making it all about money. If you buy it and keep it for the rest of your life and pass your kids, I have a good friend that just bought an additional 120 that goes to his 160. And we talked about it. He said, you know, you just, you bought that a little over market. And so you, you didn't get any equity. You're behind equity fall right now. And he said, that's okay. I, I don't ever plan on selling it. And I'm like, fantastic. And we talked about fixing it up. And so I want to make, you know, for the listeners that follow me or will start, hopefully, this isn't, I'm not making this about money, but I am trying to uncover another aspect that nobody talks about, that there is tremendous wealth opportunity that may, maybe not for you, but for your family. And I, I think it's fantastic that you could take hold of an asset that you can enjoy and build wealth for your family for literally for generations, but it's not all about that. And the, the because definition you, of wealth, because you get to enjoy it along the way and build memories well, exactly. and camaraderie and bring right. family in and That's share wealth. that experience. That is as rich is as wealth. life gets. When I, I tell my wife, you know, like in a couple of weeks, like right now I'm driving to deer camp and I got a guy from Michigan, his son, another guy from Pennsylvania. They're all at my camp. And in two weeks, I'm going to have another whole crew, four nephews, my brother, uh, a family friend of one of my nephews, and uh, two other guys, one guy I went to high school with and his son. And we might have nine guys crammed into my camp. And last year, we didn't shoot anything. We didn't shoot a single deer. Actually, we got one little small doe that looked like a German shepherd. And But that's not what we remember. We hey, remember man, la- last year was, was like that in the calendar <laughs> world. I, yeah. Our camp was the same way. It we was like vacant. The deer were yeah. absolutely woods were vacant of deer. It's like they all packed up yeah. and went to Florida. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it, you know, for us, it could have been we were in a new area. We didn't know it was our first time out in public land. We literally just walked out in the woods and sat down in a likely spot. And you know, it, it, it's just it was a tough year. But you know, it, but that's not what it was all about for hey, us. I, I got a I got a stand that I call a fifteen minute stand. And it's on one of a one of the properties I lease, and it's got that name because it only takes fifteen minutes after open. Oh, I man. mean, I've killed so <laughs> many whitetails, and now my buddy came up this past weekend, and I'm the kind of guy, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a unique animal. I put in all this work and have you know a friend or two that comes up and hunts with me, and and they typically come up for a weekend or something, help me get some of this work done. And me being the nice guy that I am, I always give them kind of stand choice and I never take my best stand off the choice list, you know? <laughs> and, right. Yeah. And so I gave him my best stand for two mornings and then of course he got it done and I didn't, but you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, I sat in that stand last year during gun season, every day of the gun season. And I only saw like four does the whole entire gun season. So I don't think even if you guys had, you know, gone out there, I think the majority of people last year, at least up by us, had a really hard gun season. Yeah, well, I didn't see a deer during gun season last year, but that's all right. I didn't even have my own farm. I let my brother and my nephew have the farm to themselves. So you're like me. <laughs> yeah, I just let them have it. And people are like, I mean, you put all that effort and time and sweat. And I said, yeah, but I got a chance to go muzzleloader hunting, and I did see some nice deer during that and, but but you were touching it, on it when i cut you off and it's not about me personally it doesn't sound like it is for you i don't have to go out and shoot a deer to have fun i know it's um, it's about the time outside kind of as uh you yeah. know fred bear and ted nugent said cleansing of the soul oh um, totally <laughs> totally and, i mean i just posted a picture the other day on my instagram it was me in a stand and then somebody said, you ought to be a poet. I, I, I took a photo just as the last couple minutes of light, the sun was shining through these trees. It was the absolutely most beautiful thing. And there was that moment where the, all of a sudden you feel that temperature drop and everything gets quiet. And there's a few chickadees that are flittering by, but even the squirrels have quieted down. Yep. 
And it's the end of the day. And I took a snapshot and I got a lot of positive comments about that because that's what it's about to me. I, when I walk through the woods now, I notice that damp earth smell that leaves and I, the, that the colors, um, the texture of the bark, I don't know, the, every little twirl. And I sit there and count the number of animals that come visit me. And I'm just, I just try to like be invisible in the woods. I don't use scents. I don't anything. I mean, I just go out there and I sit quietly. I get so, it cleanses my soul. It, it, I mean, it touches me. It always has since the time, the first time I ever got to go hunting. It touched me someplace. And so many guys can relate to this. And yeah, would I like to shoot a big buck every year? Well, sure I would. I shot a few nice ones, but I'm not one of these TV celebrity guys that you see that seem to shoot something big every year. And I'm not a fanatic about it either. I mean, I, I, if I get a re- representative buck, I'll be happy. And the guys that are in my camp right now, they were, you know, I'm, I work for Whitetail Properties, as I said, and they're like, oh, you know, what do you got? 160s, 170s. I said, look, guys, yeah, they're there. Just come up and have fun, right? If you want to shoot your first Wisconsin buck because you've never shot one, I don't care. Whatever makes you feel good. And I actually, I would like to have a, a, a couple deer on the meat pole for a nice picture because that's what I'll remember. That'll hang on my little trophy wall of photographs of all my hunts and it's me- memories and I'll remember that and the size of the buck is, is secondary if it even matters at all but that's just how I am I'm leaning towards bigger bucks as I mature I don't tend to shoot littler bucks but I don't look down on people that do I, I, you know, whatever makes you happy and turns you on man it's make an ethical shot I'm all for it I'm right there with you man I um you know we, we tend to try to manage the property for larger deer um and 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 it's really the my one lease um just because they're there and they exist and if you do it you know you're gonna get bigger bucks if you if you let the little ones grow but anybody who is new um into hunting there's no restrictions i I, you shoot whatever you want um exactly we all did (laughs) yep we all did we had to start somewhere and you know like my buddy who came up this past weekend he he shot a buck on the farm last year and you know it's his biggest buck he's ever shot i let that buck walk three days earlier um uh, that's my choice that's not his and uh, that was my choice because i've shot a lot of bucks before and you know like you as i age i'm always trying to kind of do better than i did last year you know will, i'm willing to let the buck the size of the buck that i shot last year go in hopes that there's a bigger one and that's a personal thing for me. I, I don't push that upon anybody else and I don't push it upon my guests up at the farm. You know, my buddy who shot this buck last week, um, it was limping and he was actually thinking about letting it go until he saw it limping. And then he shot it and he texts me, says, Hey, you know, I shot a pretty nice buck. It was limping. And I'm like, well, you know, you didn't have to bullshit me about him limping because you know, he thought it wasn't quite big enough, man. You know, he's bigger than one he shot last year. That's all I'm asking for. You know, if you come out, like, you know, shoot a nice one and then try to try to improve on that next year, you know, and, and then come back out and let's kill some does because we're not doing enough of that either. <laughs> yeah. So well, I, on my, my farm, I've asked my guys, I, I, I am trying to get some older age class deer to see what the potential of my land could be. And so I am trying to shoot for a three-year-old. Yep. Um, but really, I, I think about the buck size, probably 10% of my waking day. I think about what am I planting next year? Where do I put the next water hole? Oh, what's clear cutting? That's the stuff I think about 90% of the time. And the deer are going to come as a result of that. But that's, my, that's what I get jazzed about nowadays is the land management aspect. I just, I just really, really, really enjoy my tractor time and my chainsaw time. Well, my, More than anything. you know, my buddy shot, shot this buck on Friday and, you know, we got all weekend and he's like, Oh, get up in the tree. You know, and I'm like, dude, you shot a buck. Like, let's get this thing out of the woods. Let's have a beer. Let's enjoy the time. Yeah. And like, I, got, I got all week, man. I, I, I live close to this place. Like I can come back on a Tuesday morning. You can't like, let's enjoy the time together. And yeah. Let's and, soak it up. and he was really adamant that I hunt. And, um, I, I, I kind of, I don't know, you just didn't, you know, you, you get to that point where it's like, you put enough pressure on the woods, 
as a you know kind of a manager of that land you uh it, it i'd rather get the farm work done at this point hey you're, you know you're done you're, you're done hunting the pressure's off i don't have to sit in the woods with you and you're here for a couple more days well let's improve this place while you're here and we got time like i'm okay with yeah. hunting next week I, if we go hang a tree stand on Friday, like I can come back hunting on Monday, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's so, the joy. Is well, it, your own land. It, it is. And, and that was, you know, I think he kind of struggled with it. And, and again, I think this is a lot of, uh, a lot of guys, you know, they, they, you're in, you're in real estate. Uh, I'm in uh, outdoor media and, and guiding, you know, I'm got a pretty rigid schedule during the guide season, but after that, I'm kind of, in this floating time period where I have a lot more liberties to, to hunt during the week than a lot of other guys who cram things into the weekend. And it's a little interesting sometimes dealing with, you know, somebody like that, um, on the farm because they're just like, yeah, you got to hunt, you got to hunt. I'm like, no, man, I'm just enjoying my time up here. If we can get a few things done to help improve this for the next hunt or the next season, like I'm way more happy about that than killing a deer at this point in life. Yeah. So you're headed up to deer camp, huh? I am. You uh, were a little bit uh, saddened on the phone when we were talking the other day that you think you might have missed uh, the fun and exciting part of the rut. Well, I got in there for four days in the last third week of October thinking maybe I'd hit the pre-rut. They tend to move around a lot. And I didn't really see much of anything other than that little buck. And then I came back in the... Like right after Halloween, I was there, I think November one, two, three, four. And again, I, I did see one of uh, a nice mature buck, but again, I didn't see a whole lot of activity. I did see a little bit of chasing. Uh, one afternoon I was going out and I looked out the window of my cabin on the food plot and there was a buck chasing a doe. He had his nose down and he was pushing her through some corn that I'd planted. And, and so I got my stuff on and I decided to walk the road down and loop into the southern end of my farm and and as i was almost to where i was going to cut back into the timber i looked in some swamp grass and there was a really beautiful probably 135 maybe 140 inch uh buck staring at me and and i'm pretty sure i had a hot doe and that's why all that activity i did have a little buck run by me um but and then i had to go the next day because i just i can't stay hunting all the time i gotta get back to work a little bit and family so then I see my it's phone. It's a struggle this time of year, you know. It is, it is. And I think I missed it. But now I'm hearing, you know, maybe they're in lockdown, but that's not so bad. I mean, was it not November 9th, I think we're at right now when yeah. we record this? Yeah. So my guess is that maybe some of them are the bigger bucks are locked onto a doe, but that'll last for a few days. Then they'll be on their feet again. And it's, you know, it's a marathon and that's not a sprint. And, and I've been, you know, am I complaining that I got, four days in the third week of October, four days in the early November. I'm getting four or five more days in mid-November. I'll be coming back for four or five days for rifle season, late November, and then I'll be coming back for muzzle or heck no. <laughs> you can't complain I'm, about that, man. I am not complaining, man, because for decades, I lived vicariously through the television shows because I had to travel with my former career, and I didn't get to do this, so... I am soaking it up. There's no pressure. I just enjoy it. That's all I'm doing. Enjoying it. Hey man, that's the best way. I, uh, I, I'm right there with you. I, I, it, it's, I kind of feel like I missed a little bit of the chase as well. Uh, we, we tend to have a couple hot does come off somewhere around the 20th to the 25th of October. And then it seems like almost all the does around us kind of peak out right about now. Um, yeah. that first, first full week in November, uh, I started looking back this, this week in the tree stand and it's like the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, um, all are kind of like kill days for me. And, um, you know, this, this past week sitting in the tree stand, I definitely saw bucks earlier in the week, really moving heavily. And then, um, actually on Friday morning when, uh, my buddy shot this buck. He, he had gotten down. I was on uh, 120 acres across the road and he had got down to get his arrow. He drilled this buck and went 35 yards and piled up in a deadfall. So he saw it as he knew where it was, no tracking, but he wanted to get his arrow and kind of just get out of the tree stand. You know, you shot one, right? <laughs> 
so he uh he's down on the ground looking down and all of a sudden he hears this you know big crash in front of him he thought his deer got up and he looks and there's a doe coming right at him and he hits the deck and right behind him right right behind the doe is this 100 he said 140 inch eight point and i i saw him pretty close to 140 inch if not 140 and he's like he calls me and he's like there's they're they're chasing this doe over here hot doe you you gotta get your ass over here okay Mm -hmm. so i get down and and i i start hoofing it and i got i got a clear 240s to get there and so i uh i got to what through 140 and he calls me he goes man he goes you better hurry up this buck is tending this doe and he's laying on the ground you know taking pictures this buck's banging the stove in front of him about 50 yards and so i i had kind of some topography that worked in my advantage and i snuck down this this uh low spot through that runs north and south through the property got back towards the property line where where these deer were came up over the hill and is in this big oak stand and they were on the uh, just on the other side of it in some deadfall i couldn't see him my buddy's like i'm over here i'm on the phone with him i got an arrow knock got my backpack on quiver on my bow i mean i'm like feeling like i'm out west elk hunting sneaking in on these animals yeah. and and i get about 35 yards from from the brush pile and all of a sudden they bust doe goes to the right buck goes to the left comes around the brush pile looking for the doe and i'm standing there you know, i drop the phone and he he was about 25 yards 20 25 yards standing there broadside draw back minute i hit my anchor point that buck takes off after the doe and starts running kind of at a 45 away from me towards the, the doe in that brush pile. And by the time I had swung around, I had to shift my feet and I'm at full draw. I was about to go yell at him. Hey, you know, you, you get a buck like that. You can't, eh, you, you, you can't make the yeah. doe sound and get him to stop. I'm sorry. I've done this too many times. The best thing that works, you want to stop a buck in his track and plug him yell hey as loud as he can <laughs> he will stop no matter what <laughs> and i was about to just scream at him and he just stops broadside and i'm at full draw clear shot i put my second pin on and i let him fly well the minute i watched that arrow sell, sail about four in, un- inches underneath his belly oh. I, I go I should have guess I should have picked the third pin or <laughs> third pin down. Yeah. You know? And I, yeah. I ranged it. It was 38, 38 yards ish. And I had used my 30 yard pin. So I kind of, I blew that. that but to the point that we were talking about earlier and in, in kind of that lockdown phase, that buck was locked down. But what happens during lockdown phase, and I think it's kind of a negative t- connotation with people is that you know that buck is 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 spent you know he's already chased all these he doesn't want to move anymore and you know he's laid up with a doe that is not the case now is the time to be in the woods because all you need is a hot doe to run by your stand that's it that's it because that hot doe is going to be carrying one two three four five bucks maybe and uh so it's just that kind of luck this is when luck really truly plays into the the whole game of hunting i mean you can set yourself up for everything you want build a beautiful food plot great stands everything you want but if you don't have a hot dough you're not going to shoot one it's just the way it kind of goes at this next couple weeks here um and like you said too you know they'll be on the does they'll come off it's a very fluid kind of marathon-y uh s- scenario and i love hunting lockdown because of that scenario you know even in the chase phase, yeah, they're up moving around, they're up, cha- but the does aren't receptive. So they push them really, really hard. And, you know, they might push that doe across your 40 acres in five seconds. It's just the way it goes. Um, so having that good piece of property to hold those deer there is, is great. It helps, but it really comes down to is that doe going to run by your stand or not? And did you choose the right stand that morning? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a great time of year to be in the woods, man. I, it, it, yes, it is. It, it all, by, minute by minute, it can all change. So, so I'd like to 
touch on a couple things. I, you know, you and I have talked a little bit uh, kind of offline and, and I think you offer some stuff that, that I, and, and being, you know, Northwest Wisconsin guys, um, you have that, that land management specialty of giving people advice on kind of what to do with their property. And, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity here for us to both create some content, but long term, you know, I'd like to get you back on the show and stuff and, 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 and talk about specific, more specific topics. But one of those specific topics I have that, you know, maybe we can BS a little bit about today and kind of tease another episode in the future is guy buys a piece of property. Now, what does he do with it? And, and, and really specifically, you know, for me, I'm looking at putting in, I've got, you know, roughly 15 acres of old growth pasture and 15 acres timber. And I really want to do something with that old growth pasture. Um, but it, there's so many options. There's so mm-hmm. many different things. Um, you know, you can get your, uh, for me, a pretty good pheasant cover by me. I can get the pheasants forever guy to come out. I can, you know, do one of their programs and get some native prairie grass put in. There's drawbacks to that. Um, I'm kind of more of the, and the mindset that I'd rather just cut it on my own because then I have all the control and I have some government program I have to exist within. Um, however, again, there's drawbacks to that because I end up paying more taxes. So have you, have you worked with people that are kind of in my scenario and what kind of advice could you give to somebody to, that wants to take a small old growth pasture and, and kind of build that into both kind of a bird and deer haven going forth in the future. What are some, some, some key points that you think people should consider? Well, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to take a slightly different direction than maybe what you have in your mind. Sure. That's but I'm going to answer your, I'm going to answer your question as best I can. Um, I'm going to answer that with the idea of the business side of land sales management, buying, selling, and as like an investment idea, um, because that's basically what I know very well. Well, but and, and, and that's sense, kind of what I was trying to get to with, okay. a, with a long winded crappy question. So all right, no problem. All right. <laughs> I appreciate so, you being able to kind of hit it home for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this, this answer can apply to a 20 acre parcel. It can apply to a 400 acre parcel or bigger. It's, it's the same concept, but what I want the listeners to start thinking about is if they, if they want to own land and you want to start with a 10, 20 acre, you know, a little wooded parcel, old farm, old fields, whatever, is to start to think about telling the story of that land over a few years of improving it, hunting it, uh, videoing it, trail cameras, creating inventory. But think about, it's almost, it's like you're being a marketer. And now you may never sell that piece of property and it may only be memories that you pass on to your family but how cool is it going to be for someday when your grandkids look at this piece of land that they're still hunting that you passed on you're dead and gone and they're going to remember grandpa did this grandpa took this in the 90s and the 2000s and the 2020s whenever you bought this property and he turned it into this and and along the way you recorded the process or maybe you bought it and now it's time to sell it and if you've created that story, you've created equity. And so this is how I would approach this. So you have your piece of property that you bought through me or whoever. And let's just say it's mixed hardwood. It's an old farmstead that maybe is not farmed anymore. It's the crappy part of a big section that the farmer owns that he doesn't do anything with because it's the old homestead. But, you know, there's a little creek bottom. There's some swampy grasslands. There's an old fallow field that was probably a pasture. And there might even be some old buildings for all decrepit and broken down. It's his non-productive part of his farm. You could buy that at a good price. He wants to get rid of it. It's just a liability. But for you, this is the makings of your dream mecca. Because the worst habitat is often the best. Look, the worst looking as far as agriculture or sales is often the best habitat for wildlife. And those are the properties that I'm going to tell people to start in your mind's eye, create that picture. That's what you're looking for. Before I get to the habitat, I'm going to tell you another secret that I've talked about so much. And that is, where do you find these properties? 
the places that you want to look for are 30 minutes of a large metro. It doesn't matter any large city in the United States. 30 minutes to an hour is the sweet spot. That's the most expensive land. If you can find this piece I just described in that zone, you've really got something. Another thing you could look for is how people are going to get there. So out of every major city, there are these geographic travel corridors that are the large freeways. In my area, I'm just outside of Minneapolis, 30 minutes, you know, I-94, I- uh, 35E, 35W are the main arteries coming in and out of the city. You get 30, 45 minutes out of there. Now you're in the county roads like I'm traveling north on Highway 35 to two lane, sometimes one lane or uh, four lane other times. And then from there, it gets into the smaller county highway to another gravel road and then maybe to the farm where I have. So these geographic travel corridors, start to pay attention to those. Then when you find those and you get down to those secondary and tertiary travel routes, you want to be two to five miles off of those. And that's the final sweet spot. That's where most people are wanting to get to 30 minutes to an hour travel, the sweet spot, not right on a travel core, but easy to road, get off on the tertiary road and then be a couple miles off of that in a quiet zone. So if you could start to think about property like that. So once you found your property and you bought it, now you start breaking it apart. And I always tell people, if you're going to start improving property for your wildlife, start with the lowest hole in the bucket. Take There's so many tools right now, like Onyx as an example. Zoom in on your property and then back out 10 miles and look around you. What do you see? Some areas you see a lot of timber. Well, timber is great, but there's times of the year where food is scarce. Putting food there might be the low hole in the bucket. Other areas, you got agriculture. There's huge fields of agriculture, corn, soybeans, typically. When the corn comes down, what's missing? Cover. You got a lot of food and spent grain, you're now missing cover. You might even be missing food at certain times of year. That's the lowest hole in the bucket. In my area, I don't have flowing water. Water is my low hole in the bucket. So I've been putting in water holes. So to answer your question of like starting improving the, uh, the habitat, look at the lowest hole in the bucket. What can you influence pretty simply, pretty easily? Not a lot of equipment because you might not have it. And that's what you want to focus on. Um, and if you do that, start to record your process. Take your iPhone. Set up on a tripod if you want to get really fancy and talk about it. If you want to start getting trail camera photos, do um, capture the wildlife that starts showing up. I've seen it on my farm. There was no turkey. Now I have turkey. There were no pheasants. I have pheasants running around. I don't have a lot of grouse because I need to do some timber stand improvement and, and woodcock and grouse are going to relate to that early successional growth that I don't have right now. Um, the deer are starting to come. I've seen my deer go from a lot of little basket rack, one and a half and two and a half year olds. So now I'm seeing some 130, 140s class deer that are in the three and a half to four and a half year old class. Document the process. Those those things that you can do that, you're not only are you helping your habitat and you're enjoying the process, but you're creating a documented story of what you did. And that will relate to a better sale price someday. Everybody, so many people tell me, well, I'm never selling. Okay, you may not sell, but your grandkids might sell. Record it for them. Keep it as a memory if they never sold. It'll be really cool to see in a scrapbook on the hunting camp kitchen table when you go back and say, look at what Grandpa did in 2021. Look at how young he was. Look at what he did, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's what I tell a lot of my clients. It's what I talk about in my blog. And that's kind of my way of looking at land. Well, and I think it's um, your approach is it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not as tangible and intrinsic as the land itself. What you're talking about is is the the memories that come with it. And again, we're talking about the richness of life. Those memories are what really truly makes you rich because you get to pass those memories on to the next generation. The legacy component of all of that is I think often not the forefront and it should be. I agree. I do agree. 
And I'll be honest with you, though, I get a little grief from my family when I sold my farm up in Mellon because I built a cabin and everybody came in and my hands prints are in the cement with my kids. And when I went to sell that, you know, my, I, I know my older brother, if you ever listen to this, would be nodding his head. He was kind of hurt. I sold the farm and his kids shot some of his first year and we had great times. I can tell you also, though, that when I moved up into my next farm where I'm at now at Indian Creek, the comfort level, the quality level, the experience level moved up a notch. And they had, they're having just as good a time there. And I'm also increasing my wealth and my network by doing it and documenting along the way. If I never buy another farm, I'm not saying that I'm going to regret that I didn't buy another farm and roll up because, and, and, you know, make the money. He doesn't really get it. It's my thing. I enjoy doing it. I love hunting and I've matured in the business side of owning land as an investment. I haven't lost sight of the enjoyment side, but I am looking at it as and then part of my investment portfolio and I'm moving up. I've now got my eye on a $1.3 million farm. And if I sell my farm and I might sell some of my other assets that I own, I might buy that for cash. I didn't start off with 1.3 million. I, I guarantee I did it. When I bought my first farm at $900 an acre for 118,000 bucks, that was a lot of money to me. I was wondering how the hell am I going to make these payments? But over time, doing what I'm kind of talking about here, I am moving up and it keeps getting better and better and better. That's just my maturity. That's how I've matured over the last 20 years, owning land and hunting. And increase my net worth in the process. You're doing it right, man. You're doing it right. <laughs> we, I, you know, hey, maybe there's going to be a big crash. Land doesn't always go up in value every year, but it has had a hell of a run. But at least it doesn't go poof like a fart in the wind. If it does crash, I'll still be able to go out there. Maybe, maybe it'll be my prepper fallback, and I'll be growing crops and pumpkins and gourds and raising chickens and having a couple beef cows. If, the whole world really does go to shit. And a lot of people are talking about that. They are. Maybe that happens. Maybe that's what this turns into. I don't know. But well, I'll be, I think uh, it's a great I'll, wealth builder. I, I think so, too. And, and you know, the ability both to enjoy the piece of property and not just watch numbers in the stock market is such a big benefit to bringing value to your life in general. Um, but moreover than that, you know, be, if you read any financial wealth building books, there's pillars that you have to have in order to build wealth. And one of those main pillars is real estate. And, and most people look at it as, hey, I'm going to buy my house and I'm going to get that paid off. And that's that pillar for them. Um, most people that I see that are very successful and either retire early or have plenty of money to leave that legacy component for their grandkids. They have more than just their home. They've got rental properties. They've got vacation property, everything that you listed off, Neil, they have. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about kind of creating not only, you know, I, can, I was trying to explain this to my daughter who's 18 and kind of it, she's struggling with, she doesn't want to go to college right away. She doesn't know what she wants to do. And she's got all these really good values for at least saving and stuff like that, that I've kind of instilled in her. And hell, she worked this summer, first, first summer out of high school, she saved 10 grand. I, hell, I wish I could have done that when I was that age. Um, so we were kind of talking about, you know, well, maybe just stay home here for a little extra long, a uh, little while longer, stay a year. You're saving at that kind of rate. You can buy real estate now. And I was trying to explain to her that you can either go rent from somebody and then they're going to take that money and they're going to put it into their mortgage, which is basically another bank, just a different way to look at it. Or you can take your earnings and put it into your real estate. The wealth building component of that is so astronomical. And people don't understand that concept oh, it's easy to rent. I don't have to cut the grass or do this or that. Um, owning land, every time you cut a check to that mortgage, 
It's more or less putting money in the bank. You're putting it away in a different form. Let me dive into that a little bit yeah. because land, land can be, a lot of people think you own land and you have an asset. And to me, it's probably maybe not a true asset unless it's making me some money. And there's multiple ways that you can do it with real estate. So my first piece of property that I bought, it was a timber and it had nothing on it. And I hunted on it. And that was it. And I was paying, paying down that mortgage. And so I was kind of like, forcing equity by paying down my mortgage. It was like my, it was my savings account. Think of it that way. I was putting $300 a month into that mortgage and every, it was like putting $300 into a savings account. Every time I paid down, I got more equity. I started off with, you know, not roughly, it's just for the sake of this argument. You know, I started off with $119,000 of debt and after 10 years, I paid that down to 70,000. So I had $40,000 of savings quote unquote, saving, i.e. equity. But then I built a cabin. Middle of nowhere, I built a cabin and I thought, I'm going to rent this thing on these new sites called VRBO. They were very young back then. And I put it up there and people started coming. Before I got out of there, I was turning away renters and I was making rent on my short stay stuff People come in for the weekends. I was making fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year from my property. It wasn't quite positive cash flow, but it was nearly neutral. At least my land was being paid for. And then lo and behold, a buyer came along, a pipeline company said, We want to buy your land. I made up the highest number I think they would tolerate, and I sold it and they bought it. I moved on to the next property. In the meantime, when I had owned that land, I started buying rental properties. And this is where people should be taking notes, I guess. My rental properties, I bought for $80,000 a unit. And there's a triplex I'm thinking of. That unit is now worth $270,000 per unit. And it pays me rent of about $40,000 a year, and it's paid off. So I have a roughly a seven dollars $750,000 asset that brings in $40,000 a year of cash. And now I'm taking that and I am paying my farm off with that asset. So the take home message here is try to buy an asset that pays you some money that you can then take that money and buy another asset and it pay down its mortgage equity. So you gain number one, increases in value 3% a year. So your basis step up, your value of your property went up 3% a year every year, maybe more. That's value number two. Maybe do what I'm doing. You're renting it on VRBO sites. I have short stays. They come out to my farm during the off season when I'm not using it for hunting, and they pay off. And I have a cash flow from that opportunity for free. And sell that thing. Well, I bought it for seventy five. I think the market value right now is easily six hundred. So those are four ways right there that I not only created cash flow, but I paid for my property. And along the way. I have all the memories. I'm food plotting. I'm improving my property. I'm creating a story. I'm gathering year over year over year photographs of the deer and the animals that I'll use for marketing when I turn it over. And maybe I never turn it over. Maybe I pass it to my kids. Well, then I create my memories. So I'm creating that family wealth. It's the only time of the year when my, all the guys get together year after year for three generations. We do not miss deer season. Had I not bought this property that, yes, I am making money on it. Yes, I'll probably turn it over and I'll just buy a bigger farm and they'll come there, create new memories. Uh, I'm also creating and improving my net worth. And I have all these classes of assets of real estate that you're mentioning. And it's the greatest wealth building asset in the world, class of assets in the world, real estate. And it's available to a college kid who's just getting out of school all the way to a 90 year old guy that I'm selling property to. Everybody can do it. The one mistake I think I, I, I in hindsight, you know, you can do that when you look back. Um, I, uh, I wish I would have gotten into rental real estate a little not early. Too late. <laughs> oh, I know it's not too late and I got plans for that, but, uh, I, uh, had I done it 10 years ago, I know that I'd be in a different cash flow position and, and, and that's, that's really for, for people who are out there, our listeners who are on the fence, 
don't be on the fence. If you have the inclination and you have the thought that you want to do this, now's the time. Well, let me tell you a way to think about that. Go out there, find a 10 acre parcel. It'll be less than 100,000 for sure at most places. It'll probably be 50,000. And find a place that you could put a little gravel pad. Hopefully, there's electricity on the road. You just bring in a post with a plug and you create a little food plot and hang a stand on it so you can hunt. Find a used mobile trailer, put it on your pad, and, and rent that thing on a site called Glamping. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you will have, I'm going to say, 20 to 30 nights a year at probably $150 a night. Guarantee it. People just want to get away. They'll come and they'll camp on your little place there. And then on the off season, turn it off. Don't rent it. And you can use that camper. You can buy the camper. I see them every day. 15000 bucks. They're on the side of the road a fifth wheel or whatever, just go make some, somebody will give it to you to get it out of there. And you don't even have to buy a good one. You know, maybe you could do a little work and fix it up and make it look quaint and paint it a cute color and put it on, you know, Pinterest, you know, and I'm telling you, if you build it, people will come and that's how you get started. And then in a year or two or three or four or five, you got some money, go do it again. Now you got $300, Four hundred dollars a month, if you average it, coming out of that one pot. Go do it again. Go find another place, and that's your business model. People don't think about these unique ways because nobody else is doing it. I'm telling you, it will work because I am doing it. Well, and I, there's I, my when, when my I'm, landman tip. I appreciate it, man, because it fits right into what I'm kind of looking at doing myself. You know, um, I've got 32 acres. I put up a pole barn. I'm gonna to septic and well drilling here in the next year and bringing power in. I'm going to basically have my, my pole barn set up as kind of a community area with a shower, laundry, kitchenette, whatnot in there. Um, and then I'm, because I'm going to do some guiding in the next few years and I want to have somewhere where people can stay. So during yeah. my on season for guiding, um, I'm considering buying a couple, two of those, um, sheds that are built out yeah like little cabins i've seen it done and just dry cabins have a community shower community bathroom yeah and i can you know have my my clients come up and stay in those from you know september 15th through december and then that off season i can vrbo them my my local archery shop a1 archery plug to them Hudson, wisconsin one of the owners, Paul I, Korn. Use, I use them as well. Yep. So they have a camp. I think it's the name of it, but I went to it in Missouri. They bought an old farm and it had a house and that's the central camp. You go in there and they got every guy, 15 guys, they're all crammed in there in the community kitchen. They have a shower. They went out and bought these little storage sheds. They had at the time when I was there, they had probably six. And each one of them had AC and heat and a couple bunks and a table and electricity. That was it. And you go there and you rent it, and it's a semi-guided hunt. And they had leased land, but I think you could do the same thing pre-scouted on public land to show people where to go. It's all these spots that you already, you know, you've already leased. And you could buy a little piece of land and put three or four of those sheds on it and rent it out for what exactly what you're talking about, as a guiding service, or just rent it out for people that want to get away yep. and, and camp. And it's a little family. And you get, you know, maybe got a you have to get a porta potty. Of course, check with the local, you know, jurisdictions and restrictions and all that. But absolutely, you just got to think outside the box. Before you know it, you got three, four hundred dollars a month of cash flow coming in that you didn't have before. Yep, you're damn you right. You just got to think outside the box a little bit. All it takes. Yep. And so that's kind of what we're uh, planning <laughs> on doing. And and it and you know it's, it's it's all I'm looking at personally. And again, it gets a little outside of the topic for today but I'm looking for a bunch of different revenue streams. I don't have to have one that pays me a hundred grand a year. If I got 10 that pay me 10 grand a year, I got the same amount of income. And so that's kind of where I'm looking at is where can I build these little revenue streams and leverage what I have today to build that wealth component 
to either step up or retire early or whatever your plan is. Um, it, it's really a, a powerful yeah. tool, Neil. It really truly is. And I don't think, I think a lot of people just kind of look at it in that box. And uh, how, how cool would it be to have income and your job at age 55, 60 is to go check on your deer camps. That's what I'm trying to that get you to. Bought, <laughs> I know that you bought over the last few years and you bought them one at a time. I can tell you this right now, and you brought up something 10 minutes ago that made me think of something, but, and you know, and this is full disclosure. I, I own probably a million and a half worth of real estate, but it didn't happen overnight, fellas. Whoever's listening to this, it doesn't happen overnight. It was intentional. It was slow, and I'm still acquiring stuff, but my first property was 119000 bucks, and I shaved to get it. And then I sold it and I moved up. And then in a long way, I bought a rental and then a second rental and a third rental and a fourth rental. And then I bought a lake lot with my fam, with my wife. And it just, it's, these are things that don't happen overnight, fellas. It takes time. But if your mind, if you just stay the course and pick an asset class and get good at it. Now I've separated myself uh, or spread myself across uh, vacation rentals, res, rec, residential rentals, um, hunting, farms farmland is next. You know, I've spread myself. Um, yeah, it's real estate assets, but that's the thing about real estate is there's so many different directions you could go. My recommendation would probably say pick one and get good at it and just learn it really well. There's sites like biggerpockets.com is a great site. There's my site, my vlog on YouTube, and we talk about this and it might, one of these is going to pique your interest. And then Reach out to that guy. I have guys call me all the time. Tell I heard you on the on your vlog. Tell me about that. Like, can you tell me more? And then I'm like most of us, I tell you, open book. It's a network that you get in, and you and I, Brian, are kind of have the same mind. And it's funny how birds of a feather tend tend to flock together, right? Oh, exactly. I mean, I mean, I just pulled into Deer Camp, and one guy's from Whitetail Properties Real Estate. That we became friends. We're like minded. My other guy, Joe, he's from Pittsburgh. He's in real estate too, followed my path from medical sales into real estate now. And we talk about it and you'll, you'll find that as you get into something and start asking questions, start young, start old, just start and find the people that are doing what you want to do. And something will pop up like this idea of this little hunting camp on 10 acres with a storage shed. Nobody's doing that guys. Nobody is. And I, I'm telling you, I almost I hate called, to share all the secrets work. on that. Because. I'm telling you. But you know what? When you share, people come to you. Exactly. I get calls all the time. Hey, we got five guys. We'll pay you 3000 bucks to use your place for a, a five days during the deer season. I could rent my place for three to 5000 bucks. Boom, just like that. Why would they not come to a little camp with three or four little storage sheds and a fire pit Maybe you don't even have a shower, but maybe you do. You hook up an on-demand shower with a propane tank and a bucket of water, and they can clean up, and they'll, they will rent that. They will rent that. You just have to advertise it and find the renters. And nowadays, social media, heck, that's easy enough to do. I mean, it's free. It, it, it can it be re- done. It really is amazing how, if you're willing to, you got to have the gumption. You got to have the, the cojones to to, to get off your ass. I just hate to say it, but you got to move. You got to make him make so I, something happen. But, yes. But, and when uh, I talk to people, when I talk to people a lot about this, they say, well, my wife doesn't want me to do that. I don't have the money. I don't know where to start. I, I know. How do I pay for this? Blah, blah, blah. Negative, negative. And I say, stop. I want you to tell me five reasons right now, how you can do it. I can do this because I know how to do this. I will do this. And your mindset, it goes one way or the other. And but this will be on my gravestone. My wife says she laughs all the time. I say this all the time. How hard can it be? And that's really been my driving focus. How hard can it be? Really, folks, buy a piece of land and drop a storage shed on there and put it on, you know, Wisconsin hunting website on Facebook, renting for the deer season, 2000 bucks. Call me. Really, how hard can it be? They will call you. <laughs> That's how you start. Well, so, and to, to your point about, you know, reaching out to people and, and if you want to know something, talk to the guys who are doing what you want to do. Um, yeah. 
you know, and that that's really where my kind of comment about the cojones to get out. You you have to to start the process because it's an education process. If you have no knowledge about this, it's going to take you a while to find the right piece of property because it's going to take you a while to educate yourself on what truly is the right right piece of property for you and what your investment is. Um, it took me three years. I looked for three years for my piece of property. Now, granted, that three years was on and off. When I finally had the time to go look, I made it happen within a half a year. But it's still a half a year of looking at property almost every week and writing multiple offers. Um, finally came to the right piece of property that it, it checked all the boxes, except for it was on a county road. But luckily, the county road, I, it's not really a county road. <laughs> it's maintained like a county road, but it's not traveled like a county road. And it was my only capitulation on the on the property, but because I fell in that 30 minute, that hour window, I was on travel corridors. I had all the pieces of the habitat that I wanted. I actually paid over list price for it because I wanted it. Do I think today that I could sell that piece of property and turn a profit on it? 100%. Am I going to make 100 grand? No. But over the next five years with all the improvements I plan on making and everything else, I'm going to turn a profit on that farm uh, when I go to sell it but I bought right. And that's the whole piece of this that I'm, I'm kind of trying to circle back around to your, 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 uh, whitetail properties. And at least, you know, you specifically, Neil, you, you really, I, I walked one piece of property with you. We stayed in touch and, um, you, that walk really impacted me when I bought property, just talking to you, walking one piece of property, I was able to take from that experience and add value into my purchase. And I appreciate that. And it goes back to that sharing the knowledge and whatnot that we're kind of talking about a little bit of the theme here today. And I, I just can't stress to listeners enough how important it is to educate yourself. And if, if, if you're on the fence, get off the fence, get out there and talk to people like Neil and educate yourself about what you're trying to get yourself into. That's probably a podcast right there about how to use an agent to your advantage and I picked up a couple things based on what you just said and our experience together and how we've known each other that I think would be beneficial. Maybe if we do do this in the future, we dive a little bit deeper because we kind of have been scratching the surface of, oh, you agree. know, everybody should do this, but there's, you just mentioned some things that I'll be upfront with you. I think you did it wrong yep. <laughs> in a way, but, uh, but in the end you got what you want, but there's, I'm, yeah, I'm a unique into- animal, man. I was willing to put in that legwork, you know, and, and yeah. that's the thing, you know, I, 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 you know, you, I, the one thing that I bucked from what you told me was I, I was using multiple agents and that, that, you know, as I know something that you've, you've stressed on that it's, um, it's not as beneficial to the bot, to you as a buyer. Um, but I, you know, again, unique animal, <laughs> I had already kind of for three years been dealing with agents on and off. And I kind of knew mm-hmm. where I was at with my purchase that I wasn't going to get a ton of attention from an agent. I, I was looking to spend a hundred grand, you know, and, and yeah. when you got guys looking to spend a half a million, just the bottom line and the, re, in the right. you know, you get more commission as a real estate That's agent, true. it gets more attention. So I kind of well, knew, this- I, I knew that going in that I was kind of low end of the totem pole. So I knew I had to work as much as possible. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and that was the only know- reason I did that. Now, in hindsight, I probably worked twice as hard as I had to, but I also was, a, I knew that I was going to also probably piss a couple guys off if I constantly banged them because I was very nitpicky on what I was looking for. Yeah. So those were the two kind of drawbacks for me as to, you know, why I kind of, I just, I dove in found stuff that was available and I called and I called and I called and I worked my ass off and I paid into real estate agent for commission probably didn't earn, but I got what I wanted out at the end of the day and I'm super happy about it, but that's not how it works for everybody because they don't, well, you know, decide to leave their career and have every day of the week to potentially drop everything and go look at property when it right. comes up. And that's well, where that's you really come in. Yeah. And that's the discussion that would be interesting. I think people kind of hear the inside, you know, track of 
of this business. It's the same amount of work. If I'm helping you buy a hundred thousand dollar properties, I'm, I'm helping a guy do a million dollar property. It's really the, the process isn't the same. And when you're an agent that does this full time and believe me, I have no shortage of, of buyers that want to buy property and, and, um, you just, it's so difficult to spend the quality time day after day, year after year, even helping somebody buy any property, let it, let it loan, a, you know, a hundred thousand or a million. So there is the time is money thing. And, and it's kind of like a delicate situation to discuss that with people and bring it up. But there are ways to like be more efficient, you know, and that's what I would tell people is like, I have buyers right now that I just flat out tell them, I said, I'm going to be up front with you. I just don't have time to go on hikes with you all every weekend. I just don't. I, for me, a business guy, I, you know, listings are the name of the game and I have to focus on, so I'm more of a buyer agent than a listing or I'm more of a listing agent than I am a buyer agent. But if I am going to work with a guy, it's because I like him. He's gotten, I've got to know him. I've taken personal interest, but even then, if Brian, if we would have kept talking, I would have said, Brian, we need to narrow this down a little bit, buddy. What are you looking for? Because a lot of buyers get like analysis paralysis. They can't pull the trigger because they keep thinking there's going to be something better. And I'm like, look, there's always something better. Just buy something and prove it. And then we'll move you up to the next one. You can start looking again. If you feel unsatisfied with this one, it doesn't have to be your only purchase. And I think times are changing. People are starting to think about that because it used to be grandpa would buy that land and it would stay in his family for generations. That's just how it was. But the biggest land turnover in the history of the United States is happening right now with the baby boomers. Land does turn over. And so approach it from the point of, I'm going to buy this. It's a good deal. It's not everything I want. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to move up and I'm going to sell it. That's just another way of thinking about it. And people get a little bit of analysis paralysis thinking, gosh, I'm going to be stuck with it. No, you're not. You can, you can sell it next year if you like. And you're probably going to make some money on it if you just do a little bit of work. If yep. you bought it right. Yep. And that's where I would come in. And I would tell you that you're overpaying or you're underpaying. That's the value of a guy like me. Exactly. And, and I do truly appreciate all this time that you spent with me and educating everything. And then, you know, you didn't even make a sale at the end of the day. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Did man. I mention and, that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and that's, I actually did some time in real estate. So I kind of know the inside baseball of some of this stuff. And yeah. that's why I kind of, I took the path I did because again, I, I knew the attention I was going to get for the money I was spending. And I knew that, um, I was very nitpicky and, and I would say early on in my process, I was definitely paralyzed because of the options and the analysis of everything. Once I started to kind of personally hone in on what exactly it was I wanted, it was very clear. This is it. This is not it. This is it. This is not it. Um, but I'm, I, again, I'm more of a unique animal in that sense. My family owned land. I got to be part of watching land develop, um, watching real estate transactions happen. And it was something I was extremely comfortable with. So I know yeah. that there's not a lot of people out there like that. And that's really, I think, where the value of a Neil Hogger Whitetail Properties comes in. You guys are well, specialists in your area. You know everything, you know. I mean, we walked at one piece of property and you were like, oh, I sold this guy the piece of property. And, I, you know, you have a lot more knowledge than you can even on face value look at um, when, when you have a, a, a new buyer come out. The knowledge base is there and it's not just, hey, I'm going to go through your vlog. And, and it's the conversation. It's the walking time, understanding the client. And then your previous history in that area of selling properties or, you know, at least knowing what's come up and what's gone because you've got access to MLS. Yeah. That stuff is super important to new buyers who are not well-versed in land uh, re and real estate transactions. I, I, I can't, I can't say it enough. You, yeah, you, I think you really, you're... really, really do need to educate yourself on who is the right person as a real estate agent to work with. Especially if you're buying land. I always said this before. If you're looking to buy a Ferrari, you're going to go to a Volkswagen guy? Probably not, right? You're going to go to a Ferrari guy because he knows everything about it. It's not, it's not much different with this. Any agent can sell you a piece of land and it happens all the time. And not to toot my own horn or any of the 
brothers and sisters at White Tail Properties because I hear it a lot too. It's like, wow, that was that was really a different experience. And it just truly is hard to explain it sometimes, but you do hear it a lot. And just this weekend, I toured a guy and and he was, I had another agent contact me about this guy. And it took him, a, took her about a week to get around to like, get him on the property. And finally he called me and I started talking to him and I didn't know he was the same guy. And we started talking. And then finally, as I was digging in, he mentioned this agent's name. And I said, oh, I didn't know. Okay. Well, she called me about you about a week ago. Well, you know, this would be respectful to her. You really should probably go back to her. And I could see him get this like dejected feeling like nobody wants to help me. And then I tried to explain to him, I'm like, well, there's this thing in real estate. It's like, I kind of have to like honor her a little bit because this thing called procuring cause and it's kind of a legal term where she was kind of like the cause of you wanting to buy this. But he was, but I don't, I asked her, I tried to work with her. She didn't get me anything. I'm, I'm out here with you and I know more about this property in the first 10 minutes talking to you than I have learned the last two weeks. I really just want to buy it. And I'm like, okay, well, all right. All right, you know, I'll help you. And it's more of a like my reputation from this agent could, you know, you're a shark, you stole him away. And it really wasn't that at all. I actually tried to push him back to her, but he didn't want to work with her anymore. And I wanted, and he just like, will you just help me buy this thing? And I actually had that another one in a Buffalo County property. Same thing. The client actually said to me, will somebody just show me the gosh darn property? And he said a couple explicatives. And I'm like, okay, I will. And it's just kind of a weird situation. A lot of people don't understand. And the point of I'm making is pick a guy that's selling in the area that you want to sell, or at least is selling the asset that you want to buy. And if it's a farm or recreational land, then you should probably try to find a land specialist. And there's a lot of us here at White Hill Properties. There's guys with other companies too that do a good job. Find a guy you like. Find a guy that understands what you're looking for. Don't waste his time. Try to be specific. If you're if you're going to be a guy that's going to take three years, you, you just got to see a lot of properties before you can make a, uh, an offer on one. Then tell him that and, and say, do you have the time to do this long of a you know buying cycle with me? And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I'm going to say, no, I don't think I do. But this is what I can offer you. And maybe, Brian, I should have had this conversation with you. Keep looking, Brian, and consider me a resource. And when you do find it, you've kind of got to narrow down. You just kind of want a final opinion because you're that close to making an offer. Give me a call. I'll walk it with you. I'll tell you the pros and cons. I'll give you the data and make it efficient for me as well. Because as a buyer agent, guys, I'm making maybe, I might make 2.4%, maybe, but more often I'm making two. And in this environment, there's brokers out there that are paying nothing to me as a sub agent unless I have a buyer agency contract agreement with you, the buyer. If I don't have that, I make nothing. If I do have that buyer agency, I'm making 1.7 to 2.0. It's just really, so do the math. A $100,000 purchase, I'm making 1700 bucks. Yeah, two, two grand. grand, something like that, right? Okay, and I have to give a large portion of that to my broker. So I'm making, personally, I'm making, oh, I'm going to get, you know, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. The, well, and and that's before the tax man gets it. Right. And then the tax man, <laughs> you know, commission taxes are really high. And then there's gas and the wear and tear on my truck and the time. I mean, just think about it. So, so I'm saying to buyers out there, just kind of keep those things in mind and be efficient. And I, and if you call me, I'm going to ask you, tell me, tell me what you're looking for. And I get a lot. Why? Well, I, I just like to go look at it. I just want to go look at it. Well, well, before we jump in the car, let's talk about the thing. Are you pre-approved? Do you, do you have a pre-approval letter? A banker is going to lend you this money 90% of the time. Well, no, I haven't talked to somebody. Okay. That is the first thing before you go hunting, you got to have a license. That's your license. When you have that, then you're ready to go looking. Maybe. Then I want to say, well, how far from home? Cause this is two hours away. You really want to travel that far. Tell me, are you going to bow hunt it? Are you going to rifle hunt it? Are you a woodcock hunter? Do you want to hunt squirrels? Like, what do you want to do with this property? Because if you're looking in Sawyer County and you, and you like to hunt small game, like squirrels, like I have a lot of buyers that want to hunt squirrels, believe it or not. There's not many squirrels up there. So we don't need to drive up there to, for me to go, yeah, there's hardly any hardwoods here. It's all, you know, spruce swamps, tamaracks, and, you know, softwoods like, you know, aspen and basswood. There's not a lot of oak here. You can bring Rural them down to old. Southern Polk County, man. Yeah, they're all right. over it. <laughs> I know. Well, that, that's what I say. So we need to focus on there. And like, when do you want to buy? How soon do you want to purchase? I mean, do you have 
your wife's permission. You know, that's a big part of it. And so that's part of a good salesman, a good businessman to focus you in a little bit. And, you know, I'll, I'll do about 100 transactions this year, 80 to 100 probably. And, you know, I can't be everything to everybody. So I, I try to like really get the process down. And, and the feedback you get from people is, wow, no agent I never ever asked me that. I, they, I'm like, well, that's, they sell houses that they don't, you know, if it's woods, if there's deer. That's really the end of it for a lot of agents. And not, I'm not busting on them. It's just, they see with trees, there's got to be hunting. Well, well there's much all like, types. You, know, you had mentioned earlier, there's a ton of different ways to make money in real estate through, you know, different asset classes in real estate. There's different asset classes, real estate agents. I mean, you've got your commercial yeah. agents, you've got your, well, your, your, yeah. your residential real estate agents. And um, so kind of to bring this kind of home and wrap things up, you know, um, it's very important to know who you're dealing with. You want to buy totally land. Um, a lot of times what happens in this, this game with real estate is somebody, somebody going to go sell something. They got to pay commissions on it. So they call up the friend of the family, the cousin, whoever else, and they list that property. So when you as a buyer go out and call that listing agent, that listing agent may be a real estate agent that primarily 80, 90% of their business, they sell homes. So they don't have that knowledge base to, to educate you about that purchase. They literally are just listing that property because of a family member or whatnot, close relative, wanted to save on commissions. So that really puts you at a disadvantage as a buyer trying to deal with that particular agent on that property. Um, that's where you kind of come in and, and really that's where, you know, me as a buyer say, I might not have enough cash to do a transaction that's going to, you know, make you my best buddy and attach to my hip. <laughs> um, yeah. I can do some of that research, send you a few pieces of property that I'm interested in, and then you knowing what I'm looking for can kind of do that back end research and go, okay, that four pieces of property you sent me, let's go look at these two. And then you can really kind of narrow things down, makes it more efficient for somebody like me and you to get this transaction done. But, uh, it, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's a lot of work and, uh, both on both sides, the buyer and the agent. And it, it really takes a cohesive effort to, to making that work for everybody in an efficient manner. Yes. Well, anyways, man, I'd love to get you back on. There's so many different rabbit holes we could have gone down today. And, and, uh, again, I, we kind of talked a little bit off air about maybe having you back as a regular guest here. And yeah. I, I definitely think it's worth both of our time. Um, there's so many different things we can discuss and I always, yeah, we talk about a lot of different things. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to get you out to my place sometime and, and, you know, just kind of give a walk and maybe we can, uh, come up with a, a, a couple different topics to talk about more specifically on the land management side too. Yeah. Anytime. I'd like that. Give, get, let's get through deer season. Then it starts to slow down. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's when that's when uh, bird hunting in Kansas starts to really call my name. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, you know I like that that Kansas weather in January, man. This you get some snow and it, it melts the next day usually. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That means we have to do this uh, from Kansas bird camp, I guess. <laughs> it's all there's going to be a few podcasts I think this year from Kansas and bird camp. So awesome, man. Well, hey. I appreciate your time today, Neil. Thank you so much for making some time for me. And um, let's uh, stay in touch here over the next week. Hopefully, we both have some bucks hanging. All right. I'll send you some text pictures. I enjoyed the time. Sounds good. I'll stay in touch here. Right. And uh, good luck hunting this week. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.